chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. And uh, let me get myself all ready to go here. All right, I think I'm ready. 1 Kings chapter 2. And uh, we're going to read uh, just uh, the, the one verse as our text here tonight. 1 Kings chapter 2. And uh, we're going to start with uh, verse number 12. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 12. And uh, I'd like to ask you to stand together as we read our text. Maybe I could have just had you stand all along. But, uh, anyway, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse number 12. Here the Bible says, Then sat Solomon upon the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was established greatly. And uh, let's go up to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, the blessing of being able to meet together. We thank you for the blessing of your word. And we pray that you might uh, speak to each of our hearts as we hear from you. And uh, Lord, that not only would we hear from you, that you'd speak to us, but Lord, that we would take the things we hear and make them a part of our lives. That we might apply the truth we hear, that it might be a help to us in our walk with you. And that it might be a help to us in our testimony in this world. And the Lord have your will and way we pray tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we're looking uh, in our series on Bible exploration. And what we're doing is essentially a Bible survey. We're going through book by book. Obviously in this lesson we're lumping First and Second Kings together. And we did the same with... First and Second Samuel, we'll do the same again with First and Second Chronicles when we get to that uh, after we finish this lesson. Uh, but it's just a Bible survey. We're not getting into the nuts and bolts verse by verse, uh, even individual by individual. We're just trying to get a survey so that we get an idea of the place that this book has in the whole of Scripture and how it all fits together. And especially, I think that's, that's important for younger Christians because when someone is, is uh, first saved, they look at the Bible and their, their eyes cross, uh, they, you know, or they roll in the back of their head, you know, just sort of, oh man, I don't, I don't know what to do with all that. And so this survey really is, is uh, to help with understanding what, uh, what the Bible's all about and how each book fits together with the whole of Scripture uh, as well as the direction it's all pointing. And so uh, we started this actually two weeks ago. Uh, we weren't here last week, so we weren't in the lesson, but we started two weeks ago, and we began uh, here uh, looking at uh, the analysis here. Of course, this is the biblical account of the kings of Judah and Israel. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, there's a number of prophets that are mentioned. A couple of them we'll actually see uh, throughout this, but we're not really going to deal with them uh, uh, specifically until a little bit later on uh, in, in our series. We looked at Solomon. He's such a key uh, individual in the book of 1 Kings. And uh, you see his reign, but we saw he was an extremist. He was either way overboard one way, and I don't know necessarily that that was overboard, but he was way over on the one side or he's way over on the other. On the one hand, he was way over on the side of, of uh, doing that which is pleasing to God, of being right with God. And, of course, the, the highlight uh, of, of his uh, reign is the building of the temple and uh, completing that. That's the greatest achievement that uh, he had in his reign. But on the other side, the greatest mistake that he made had to do with his marriages. And we spent some time looking at that. By the way, if you remember two weeks ago, there was the one verse I wanted to read and I wasn't able to because I had the wrong reference down. Uh, if you want to write this down in your notes, it says Deuteronomy 17, uh, verses 3 and 4. This is on page 2, about halfway down. Uh, the Lord commanded not to have heathen wives. That's actually chapter 7. So, you know, a little bit of dyslexia there really goes a long way to messing you up. So it's Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. Again, we looked at that last week. And so we'll go on, and uh, we're going to start tonight with, uh, with Rehoboam here at the bottom of page 2 of our lesson. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. He was to carry on, carry on the, the 
you know, the house of David, to carry on the name, to carry on the influence of David, right? I mean, that's the idea. Uh, he's supposed to carry on the kingdom, but Rehoboam was a fool. He was a fool. And, and um, it's pretty sad. It's quite likely that Solomon realized that his son was a fool. Uh, because much of the book of Proverbs was written to his son. And he's constantly pleading with him to uh, seek wisdom and to forsake foolishness. Let, let's look at this. Uh, and, and we'll see actually quite a few different things. Um, or we'll see some things about his, um, his character. Here in uh, chapter 19 and verse number seven, uh, 27 of the book of Proverbs... We see Solomon's writing to Rehoboam, his son, and he says this, Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. So Solomon realized that Rehoboam was easily influenced to do the wrong thing. Because that's exactly what he says. Don't, don't go along with that, what everybody says. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible says, uh, my son, if, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Which goes along the same lines. Uh, same sort of thing. Don't let other people influence you to do the wrong thing. And yet, when we get into this, that's exactly what Rehoboam did. That's exactly what he did. And, and we'll look at that. Here in chapter 23 of the book of Proverbs, in uh, verse number 15, the Bible says, My son, if thine heart be wise... My heart shall rejoice, even of mine. It's like Ray of Home. If you just wise up, you'd make me the happiest dad in the world. Essentially, that's, that's what Solomon's saying to Ray of Home. How many of you would like to hear your dad say that to you? If you just wise up and act smart, you know, I'd be so proud of you. What is he saying? I'm not proud of you, and you're not acting smart. Uh, and, and that's really what Solomon's telling Ray of Home. Uh, here in verse 19 of Proverbs uh, 23 it says, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thy heart in the way. Please, listen to what I'm telling you, and be wise. But that's not what Rehoboam did. His foolishness brought to a head the resentment uh, that was instilled in Israel by the harshness of Solomon's reign. Here in 1 Kings chapter 12, 1 Kings chapter 12, and we'll see in these first four verses. And again, here we begin to see some of the foolishness that was in the heart of Rehoboam. How that he could be easily influenced to do the wrong thing and to go the wrong way. Here in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Rehoboam, I'm sorry, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the pre uh, presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. Doesn't sound like a bad thing. You know, they're not saying, we don't want you to be king. They're not saying, you can't be in charge. They're not, they're not saying, you're no good. None of that. All they're saying is, please, just make it easier on us. You know, essentially, you know, lower the taxes. That's part of what was going on. As well as the forced service that was going on. Just make that a little bit easier on us and, and everything will be fine. And, uh, and, of course, he says, depart for three days and then come back. And then down in verse 12, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly, and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore, the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, 
to your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. And so what happens here, as you read through this, Rehoboam asked the old man, those who were Solomon's counselors, what should I do? And they said, do what the people said. You do what the people said, and they'll follow you no matter what you do. And they'll follow you. And he said, well, yeah, but, you know, but then i got to kind of humble myself to do that. I don't really want to do that. So he sends them away, brings in all his friends, all his buddies, and says, what do you think? Oh, man, tell them, if they thought it was bad under your dad, just wait till you get to be king. <laughs> and, and that's what he went with. So what was it? It's exactly what Solomon foresaw, that he was easily influenced to do the wrong thing. He was not wise. He was not smart at all. And so because of that, he lost the kingdom. He lost. It was divided, and it was uh, no more uh, of one unified kingdom. So then, you go through the rest of First and Second Kings, you have the division of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And we're going to look at the northern kingdom first. And we're just hitting the highlights. We're just, again, we're going to hit, I think, four different kings uh, of uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. There were more than that, but we're just going to hit these because these are really uh, the... the uh, just like I said, the highlights uh, of what's going on here. So there's Jeroboam, and we already read about him here in 1 Kings chapter 12. He had been uh, uh, exiled in Egypt. He came back before Rehoboam was crowned king. And then when Israel said, look, we don't want anything to do with Rehoboam because he's a jerk. They didn't say that exactly, but that's, that's kind of what they were saying. And so here's Jeroboam there. And so Jeroboam said, well, I'll lead you. And so they made him king. And it's interesting, 12 times throughout First and Second Kings, Jeroboam is described as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Uh, that, and, and, and we'll look at this first one, 1 first Kings 22, and verse number 52. We'll look at that one. We don't, uh, for time's sake, we're not going to read all, all 12 of those. But in 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 52, it says, And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of his father, and in the way of his mother, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. One thing that you and I do not want on our tombstone is to have that we were Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. We don't want people to remember us that way. Uh, yes, none of us are perfect. Yes, we sin. Do we want to be remembered that way? As people who not only sin, but caused others to sin as well. Of course, we don't want that. But Jeroboam did that. And, and we're going to see why. His first act, back here in chapter 12 again, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12... We see his very first act was to sever all religious connections with Jerusalem. He didn't want anything to do with Jerusalem because he felt like that would cause the ten tribes to go back. And so it, it, he felt like his kingdom was shaky unless he totally severed all ties with Jerusalem. And so he set up a totally different religious system. We see this in verse 26 of uh, 1 Kings chapter 12. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again to their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two camps of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went uh, to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, in the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast 
that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. Here's what's going on. Of course, he had fear of losing the kingdom. But what he's doing, he is bringing in idol worship, but he's telling them, we're still serving the Lord. We're still, I mean, we're, we haven't changed gods here. We're just doing it a little bit differently. We're just, it really, what he's doing is, we're just borrowing our methods from the world so that we can reach the world. Does that sound familiar? You know, most of the churches today, most of those that call themselves churches today, that's what they're doing. They borrow their music from the world. They borrow their, all of their methods from the world, from salesmanship and different things. And, and they bring that in and say, we're going to reach the world with the gospel by incorporating things from the world into our worship. That's what he did, and God said it was sin. And God said he caused Israel to sin because he did that. So should we incorporate the things of the world and the music of the world and, and the ideology and philosophy of the world into our worship so that we can reach them? No. No, one thing that God told Israel all along is you're to be a peculiar people unto me. And if you go back into 1 Peter, you find that Peter says the same thing about New Testament believers. We're to be a peculiar people, a chosen generation to God. What does that mean? We're not supposed to incorporate the things of the world into our worship, bring them into church and say, well, we're doing this so we can reach more people. Because that's not how it works. Because when we start doing that, we fall into the same sin that Jeroboam fell into. And we're going to cause others to fall into sin. Look, they said they were worshiping God, but were they? Oh, of course not. And you see that. So he set up these two idols, and uh, he ordained these puppet priests. He set a, a uh, counterfeit religious cal uh, calendar, and he ignored the warnings that came from God. God said, you're doing wrong. Oh, but wait a minute, God. We're still serving you. They're using all the same terminology. But it wasn't the same anymore. And there are people today, the same, same thing. They call it church. They call it a Bible. They call it worship. I mean, it's all the same terminology, but it's not the same thing anymore. It's different. And uh, he was warned, but he refused to listen to the warning. Here in chapter 13 and verse 4, came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar of Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it uh, in again to him. Now, uh, the prophet prayed for him, and his hand was healed. But here's the thing. When God said, This is wrong, you're doing wrong. You need to change what you're doing. Did he say, oh, maybe I should change what I'm doing? No, he didn't say it. He said, hey, get a hold of this guy. We're going to throw him into prison because we don't like what he's saying. Isn't that what all the modern churches do when you say, look, you shouldn't be using the world to try and reach the world? They say, aha, you're judgmental. You get out of here. You know, you're, you know, you're this and you're that. They, they say all sorts of things, but they don't want to hear the warning. Just like Jeroboam didn't want to hear the warning. Here in uh, chapter 14 and verse number 7, it says, Go tell Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but hast done evil, above all that were before thee. That's, that's a pretty serious statement there. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. We're still worshiping the Lord. But God said, no, this is other gods. You're not even worshiping me anymore. You may be using my name, but you're not really worshiping me. 
and it says, and molten images, to provoke me to anger and to cast me behind thy back. So this is Jeroboam. This is where it starts with the northern kingdom. And it doesn't get better from this point. It goes downhill from there. So next we're going to look at um, Ahab. Ahab was, uh, he was even worse. In fact, uh, the Bible says he was the most wicked king to set on the throne of Israel here in chapter 16. Verse number 30, <clears throat> and Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now, he just said that about Jeroboam. Now, Ahab's done even worse than those that were before him. Verse 31, it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which uh, he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the uh, Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. That's not a good thing to have God say about you. Over in chapter 21, in verse number 25, it says a little bit more about Ahab in regarding his character here. It says, but there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. In other words, he went way out of his way to do what was wrong. I mean, really, that, that's, that's what that's saying. Uh, none of the other kings were so set to do wrong. But Ahab, he was a unique guy. Jeroboam led Israel into, into a perverted worship of Jehovah. But Ahab, with the encouragement of his wife Jezebel, established the vile worship of Baal. And Elijah's warning, uh, his ministry of warning, uh, came during the reign of Ahab in chapter 17 and verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And uh, if we spent the time, we could, we could spend weeks uh, just looking at Elijah and his ministry and all the things that God did with him. Uh, but we're, we're not going to do that this time. Maybe, maybe later we'll go back and, and do that, uh, that sort of thing, kind of look at some character studies. But here in chapter 19... We see that Jezebel, of course we know if you read through First and Second Kings, you see Jezebel, she was a conniver. She was not above going behind Ahab's back and making rules and telling people what to do. She's the queen, that's all fine and dandy, but she wasn't the king. The king had the power. You know, the queen, she may have the king's ear, but she doesn't have the power, and yet... On several occasions, Jezebel, on her own say-so, caused the death of different individuals. Naboth uh, is one that I think of, but she also was the one who caused the death of some of the prophets of the Lord. Uh, she herself, not Ahab, he wasn't credited with that, but she was. So she was, again, a unique individual, married to Ahab, a unique individual. But uh, she persecuted the, the people of God. In uh, chapter 19 and verse 2, Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life, it's the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She was upset with him. Oh, you're not doing to please me. You're not doing to suit me. And so she sent this message. And, uh, you know, Ahab told her what all Elijah had been doing. And she didn't, she didn't even bother. You know how some, some wives are? They tell their husband, you need to go do this, and you need to tell them I said that. Jezebel didn't even bother with that. She just went and did it herself and uh, sent him a message. Uh, again, unique couple. Uh, Ahab and Jezebel both met violent deaths as prophesied by the man of God. Here in chapter 21 and verse 19, uh, it says, And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession, and thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick 
thy blood, even thine. In verse 23, and Jezebel also, and of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. For time's sake, I'm not going to read these others. Uh, but you can read those other passages, and you see the exact fulfillment of God's uh, word, of, of the prophecy here that's given. And you know one thing that we learn from that is that what God says is always going to come to pass. Now, Ahab, it was a little while before that happened with him. With Jezebel, it was quite a while before it was uh, fulfilled in, in her life, uh, the prophecy here uh, concerning her death. But I mean, it, it, was, it was a number of years. Ahab had been dead for a while, and, and uh, two, two of her sons had, had sat on the throne as king before this ever happened. And I'm sure there were some people sitting back and laughing. Oh, yeah, see, Elijah said this, but look, she's just fine. She's just going on like nothing. And that's what we do sometimes. We see what the Word of God says, but then because it doesn't come to pass immediately, we begin to disbelieve it. We begin to mock at it. We begin to scoff at it. Uh, just like Peter said about in these last days, this many scoffers will come saying, where's the promise of his coming? And that's what people say, right? Yeah, I, I, I've seen it uh, all over the internet. Uh, atheists will say things like, look folks, it's been 2,000 years, Jesus isn't coming. It's scoffers. Because God's word isn't fulfilled just right now. Oh, well, that, that can't be true. You know what the book of Ecclesiastes tells us? Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. What does that mean? Because God doesn't judge sin right now, then people go ahead and keep doing it. Right? They think they can get away with it because they were, I, I got away with it last time. Right? I mean, that, that's, that's the way it is. And that's the way people think. And, you know, Elijah, he gave that prophecy to Ahab. You know, he had to wonder. Because there were times, as we know on Mount Carmel, he prayed to God and immediately fire fell from heaven. Now he gives this prophecy, and it's years. Do you think he wondered, Lord, was, was that true? I mean, were, were you really telling me to do that? Or was I just... just talking about what I thought should happen. Sometimes we begin to think that way. Is this, is this really what God means? Or should it be something else? Because we don't see things coming to pass uh, as the Word of God says. What does this tell us in the long run? It tells us we can trust the Word of God. Even if we don't see it coming to pass right away, we can still trust the Word of God. It's going to happen. And it's going to happen exactly like God said. Just exactly like that. Let's go on and look at Jehu. And uh, she, now, Jehu was the best of a bad lot. None of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel were good kings. But Jehu, he was the best there was. Uh, the evil uh, dynasty of Omri, uh, which came to a climax, obviously, under King Ahab, and Jezebel was terminated by Jehu over in 2 Kings chapter 9 in verse 22. It says, It came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And uh, Joram, of course, is the king of Israel at this time. He's uh, one of the sons of Ahab. And he, uh, he, that is Jehu, answered, What peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? And Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, Ahaziah is the king of Judah at that time, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms. And the arrow went out at his heart and sunk down, and he sunk down in his chariot. So here's where uh, the, the dynasty of Omri, who was uh, Ahab's father, ends. And Jehu feigned a great zeal for God. He goes through, if you, if you read through this, uh, he goes through and, oh man, uh, this, we're going to do this because this is what God prophesied. 
And it sounds so good. You know, oh, man. Hey, we can get behind Jehu because he's quoting scripture. He's telling us about the prophets. Wow, here's somebody who really thinks things, uh, you know, he, he thinks just like we do. He wants to follow God just like we do. We've got to be careful about that. People who come along quoting scripture are not always people who care about God. Jehu didn't. And, and we'll see that as we get into this. Uh, so he destroys all the family of Ahab here in chapter 10, in verses 10 and 11. Uh, know not that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord had done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, and all his great men, and his kinfolks, and his priests, until he left him none remaining. Now, having said that, yes, that was the prophecy of God, and yes, he was absolutely right in saying, you know, there's nothing of the word of the Lord that's going to fall to the ground. That's true. But as the new king, it was their, it was their pattern to kill all the family and all the allies of the old king and of the old dynasty. That's just what they did. He's just using, oh, this is, this is what God said. He's just using that as a pretense. He's using it as an excuse to go ahead and do what he's going to do anyway. It's not that he was really wanting to serve God. Again, you see that because, because as you follow through in his life and see what's going on, uh, you see that carried out. He even put uh, a temporary end to Baal worship here down in verse 25 of 2 Kings chapter 10. Uh, and it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, Go in and slay them, let none come forth. And they smote them with the edge of the sword, and the guard of the, and the captains cast them out and went to the city uh, of the house of Baal. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a, a draft house unto this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. Boy, that's a great thing, isn't it? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Because, you know, Baal, he's, he's a false god. That's a wonderful thing that he did that. And yet, he followed on after the sin of Jeroboam. He never, none of the kings of Israel left that alone. He, so he's saying, yeah, we're going to follow the Lord now. But when it got to a certain point, it's like, eh, we've done enough. We've done enough now. We, we, can, we can go back to how we've been doing. You know, let's straighten things out to a certain degree. People do that all the time, don't they? Oh, we want to follow the Bible. We want to do what God says. And they'll do some things, but then they'll get to a certain point and say, well, we've, we've done enough. Let's not go too far. Let's not be a fanatic about the things of God. Here again in chapter 10 and verse 29, how be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from them to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel, and that were in Dan. So here it is. You know, he had a good talk, but good talk is never enough. There has to be a proper life, a holy life that follows through with what we say. <clears throat> we can say, I believe in Jesus. That's all well and good. But there are a lot of people say that they believe in Jesus that don't. They talk about believing in Jesus, but they don't act like it. They don't live like someone who believes in Jesus. And so it's not enough just to talk about it. There has to be a life that proves that up. And Jehu talked about believing in God, but his life didn't prove that. Uh, and and uh, anyway, there are a lot of people nowadays, well, God sees my heart. You know, I'll talk and talk and talk, and I'm not going to live it, but God sees my heart. And, and that's really where Jehu falls. He talked about God, but then in the end, well, God sees my heart, and it wasn't really how it should have been. Let's look at Jeroboam. Jeroboam 2. So he's called Jeroboam 2 because, you know, there's two of them there, but he's not of the same family as the first Jeroboam. He's actually the great-grandson of Jehu, and uh, it's the only other king that we're going to take note of. Uh, the only other king of Israel. Jeroboam was able to throw off the Syrian oppressors here in chapter 14 of 2 Kings. 
and uh, give them some relief uh, from all those around them. Here in uh, verses 25 and 26, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain according to the word of the Lord uh, God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, uh, the prophet, which was of gath Hefer. Uh, for God saw, or for the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. They were in just a, a bad, bad, bad place. So here's the aftermath. With the death of Jeroboam II, uh, the kingdom really declined. Their fortunes, they just, they were, they could not recover. And when you get over to chapter 17 and verse 6, you see that the Assyrian Empire then engulfs the nation of Israel. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and in Habor by the river Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. What had happened is the, the warnings of the prophets of God had gone unheeded. And the long suspended sentence of divine judgment was at last executed. So again, God is going to fulfill his word. And they had been warned, God's going to judge your sin. God's going to judge your sin. And they're like, well, look, when granddaddy was around, the prophets were saying God was going to judge our sin. And look, everything's just as good as it always was. God's not judging us. And so they just kept on and kept on. But eventually... Even though they didn't listen, eventually God's word was fulfilled and the judgment fell. Here in chapter 17 and verse 13, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God, and they rejected his statutes and his covenants uh, that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, and used divination and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel, and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. And what a sad statement. But the whole point is, not that God was being mean to them, that's not it at all. The whole point was they wouldn't listen to God. They refused to listen. God told them again. God was very patient with them. He was very, very patient with them. But they would not hear. You know, that is the same God we serve today. God is very, very patient with you and I. He's very patient and he gives us his word. And he gives us his message and he says, you need to trust my son. And people, many times, they hear the message over and over and over, but they will not listen. In other words, they will not trust Christ. They won't turn to the Lord. And in the end, judgment will fall. Mercy will eventually come to an end. And judgment will come just as it did in the nation of Israel. So it's an important thing for us to learn from this to listen the first time God speaks instead of making God say it again and again and again, right? You know, that, that's, what I told, uh, that's what I told my boys when they were young. I said, the first time that I call you, I want you to come. Now, this was great when they were first learning how to walk. You know, I'm the other side of the room and come here. And they're like, you know, I can't walk that far. I can't crawl that far. Of course they could, but... Uh, the fact of the matter is they didn't want to. But it took, it took some work with them, but eventually they learned when dad and mom called the first time, 
they needed to answer. And that's, that's what God wants us to learn. The first time that God speaks to us, we need to answer and to do that which he tells us to do. Let's uh, stop here. Let's uh, stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And uh, just think about the truth that we can glean from the nation of Israel and how that...